Okay, then we start them. We shall. Yeah. Okay. Hey, everyone. It's we again. Um, uh, we. I am Daniel Bistrom. I am sitting here together with Chris Doyle, uh, and we are about to to make another our future talk. This time we have landed in North Province of Rwanda. It's like it's really something that we can just fly around like this and almost like Google Earth, just zooming in on different places. But not only that, we will actually zoom in that far so we will meet the people and actually get into the soul of the community. And uh, this is a very special occasion today. We will be on, a, on an Igitaramo, real Rwandan Igitaramo, a digital one. And uh, we will uh, walk us through this program to get with Greg that we will present soon. And uh, then we will um, get to know the, the local culture and have a really interesting uh, dialogue together with an invited panel for today. Will you say something? Excellent. Yes. <laughs> and so uh, we have the good fortune to uh, be hosted by our local champion, Greg Bakunzi, whom I've known for a couple of years and in his incredible work uh, in Rwanda. And one of the things over the last couple of years I've learned about Greg in his work, it's centered around societal development. Uh, all of the work that Red Rocks Rwanda and Red Rocks initiatives has been centered on has brought forward so many community matters. I mean, he's involved in agritourism projects, conservation research, livestock programs, agriculture programs, botanical gardens, biodegradable, new, innovative new products skills development, arts and culture programs, the list is plenty. And it's about a holistic view of, of bettering communities. And oh, by the way, tourism can benefit at the same time. And so I've been monitoring him personally for a long time. And when we started the uh, Our Future program, I was thinking, boy, we could all learn a great deal from Greg and his community member members. And so, Greg, thanks for being a mentor on community-based tourism development. I'm going to hand it to you just now, and uh, you'll help warm us up here. So off to you, Greg. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, thanks uh, so much, Daniel, for making this happen. We are so, uh, I would like to welcome everybody here, and we are so excited to lead a present what we have been doing here in Rwanda. And I would like to mention that Gitaramo used to, um, it's a, a Rwandan name which was used by the local people. Uh, even the king himself would really join uh, to make the event, to enjoy the event where everyone can show the talents and what they, are, they know and what they can do in their daily life. So for this evening, we are happy to show the Gitaramo, and I have to say that Daniel and Chris, you are the king of this event. So let's get the event start um, by welcoming everybody so that you see how Gitaramo used it to be. As you can see, we have got some local drums with different local instruments from drums. We have got some people who are doing the waving. Normally in our culture, when we are doing this kind of event, we have a kind of like a banana beer in a sort of a calabash, and people are tasting it, playing uh, umuduli, inanga. So you can see that everybody is really uh, ready to grace the event that is going to be taking place uh, this evening with different instruments. So uh, let me welcome on the dance as we open up um, our event, which is taking place very soon. Uh, so I would like to make a very quick introduction about the song they were singing. This song they were singing is in a Rwandan uh, culture showing that where can you get this kind of the culture? As you can see, every country has got its own culture. 
So this is a different one. They all, they are so proud of their culture. They are so passionate about their culture. And that's why they are saying, where can you get this kind of culture? So they are so, that's a sign that they are so really proud about their culture. So they are gonna come up with another quick song very soon. Uh, with a quick uh, introduction of the song that has been really going on, it's like this kind of culture is really needed and totally from uh, how they are benefiting from the tourism, it's this kind of culture that is really needed. As every culture is, as I have said, that every culture is quite different. You go to Congo, you find a different culture. You go to Kenya, you find a different culture. So it's, uh, they are using their own culture to see how can they benefit from what we are doing. So that's the song they were really uh, singing right now. So um, without wasting too much time, well, we are going to go to, uh, to the actual event. Uh, definitely, we're gonna be having the closing ceremony. So they are not going anywhere, they are gonna be here. But for the meantime, let's jump on the table and uh, we go into the full event of the day. Uh, Red Rocks Initiative uh, is uh, an initiative that came from us when we were from the community, from I myself, who have been in the industry for a long time, trying to see how can community uh, conservation and tourism really benefit the, the local communities that resides along the protected areas. After really seeing the success from this, we have also started moving to other parts. We started this in the northern part of Rwanda, uh, where we are right now. Uh, so we have to say, this is the backbone of the tourism industry of Rwanda, where even investors and everybody, like Pravin, when he came here, he came straight away to here. He knew that this was the Rwandan destination of ecotourism we have to even brand it as an ecotourism destination of Rwanda. And that's why we are sitting this evening, broadcasting all this event and also trying to show what have we been going through and what kind of uh, initiatives that we have really initiated from art, um, no, you know, not, uh, from art to skills development to cultural preservation. Imagine who after seeing how these were really dancing, it shows that they are proud, they are passionate about the culture, and they are happy to share this with other people from around the world. Uh, we have come up with different community initiatives, and with all these community initiatives, we wanted to make sure that we share this with other people, not only just like having it with us, and also try to build a strong uh, partnership with other organizations, uh, all private people who are also interested um, in this kind of uh, initiative that we are learning uh, in our region, as we also try to extend it to other people. Imagine if we create a cultural exchange programs with people from Sweden, with people from US, with people from Congo, this could be like a huge a tourism, a community tourism event that can even accelerate and bring the whole Africa on the world map as an ecotourism, as an agriculture tourism exchange program. I would like really uh, to thank uh, Chris Danny. I have known Chris for a couple of years. I would really like to thank you for bringing us, showing this event on this evening right away from here. It's an event that we were not even expecting. Even our community who are sitting here, they are really so uh, passionate and excited to see that this is something that is being screened around the whole world while we are sitting at home. I know the COVID has teaching us a lot, even though we still have a lot to learn, but at least we have the startup. So thanks so much for really pulling us from here and also bringing some open-minded people who are passionate about this, who have been seeing the journey of the Rwandan tourism along the way uh, from 1994 up to now. I think we have walked 
uh, a long distance, uh, but we, we are not yet there. We still have a long way to go, but let us really try to collaborate and do a lot of the partnership to see how we can accelerate our initiatives. Thank you. Greg, thank you for that. What a wonderful opening. I want to come back, Greg, to something you said. You're, you're extending thanks, <clears throat> which uh, I, I appreciate, but I'd actually like to, to kind of bounce that right back to you because you've opened up my eyes and I know the eyes of many people to really how things should be done. And as you know, I was trying to work with uh, the Rwandan Development Board and to try to get some movement and action. And you would push me back a bit and you said, actually, Chris, let's not wait for anybody. Let's create our own action. Let's start moving. And so that's what resulted in this. And uh, so uh, I, I would just share that thanks with you. Um, this is just a wonderful way to showcase a destination and, and you're inviting us into your home. And it's just a gift for all of us. So thank you for that. I would like to now just do a quick introduction to Praveen Maman, a longtime friend and colleague. And, you know, I haven't said this to you, Praveen, but I view you as one of my top mentors on many different levels. Uh, Praveen, Praveen has been there. Uh, I, I was involved with a global organization in tourism. Praveen has always been there, always present, always offering guidance. Uh, a conservationist, a philanthropist, deeply involved in policy, deeply involved in the private sector, in the public sector. And of course, most of you in Rwanda are familiar with him for uh, his work in the Virunga region. Uh, Praveen, you know, one of the things I, I observe about you over the years is just the depth of your understanding of the bigger picture. And that's why we invited you to come and maybe offer a bit of reflection on the his, historical context of tourism for Rwanda, the present state and kind of some vision on the future. I know we don't have a great deal of time, but maybe for the next 10 minutes or so, you can, you can offer that summary for all of the audience here. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for all of you who've been organized, helping organize this amazing Igitiramu event. Um, I don't know where to start. It's a long journey that I have with both of you, uh, with this region, with the sort of things that particularly Greg has been doing on the ground. So thank you for asking me to share what I've been trying to do and what I believe Greg, Greg has been doing in parallel and how we try and build on this. Well, I've known both of you in different ways for 15 years. Um, Greg is very modest. What he doesn't tell you is that he grew up in a refugee camp in Uganda. And one day after the war ended in Rwanda in 1994, uh, some years after that, I forget exactly the date, I think around 2000, if I'm right, or was it earlier, Greg? Um, Greg decided he'd go home and he walked from this refugee camp where he'd grown up back to his home country. And of course, that's around the time that I started working uh, also in Uganda and then in Rwanda from 1997 onwards. And we all lived through a phase that was really quite upsetting, quite demoralizing, quite uh, worrying for all of us, uh, because with the Rwandese genocide and all the historical events that went around it, basically the whole Great Lakes area went into a huge conflict. And we had the Congo War, the first Congo War, and the second Congo War. And somehow for different reasons, Greg and I had parallel journeys in trying to make make stuff happen in this complicated area where Africa seemed to have exploded. At the same time, I met Chris uh, Doyle in Seattle in, I think, 2006 at the Adventure Travel Trade Association. And these two are quite important poles in, I think, how we all need to think about tourism. So on the one hand, building bridges with other partners in the area, like Greg and I were doing different things. Greg walked up to this lodge I was building in 2004 called Virunga Lodge. And he just walked up the hill one day and said, wow, this is amazing. What are you doing? And then he told me about what he was doing. And from that time, we've had a very strong shared bond. And then on an international scale, I developed an equally strong bond with Doyle, as he's called in that, in that industry, so to speak, um, of how to connect these forgotten areas of this world, these fragile areas of, this world, of the world, 
where sometimes very deep and symbolic stuff happens, which affects us all and we should all know about. So these two poles have been very important. And this journey that you've organized today for Northern Rwanda is especially important um, because this tiny area around the Virungas in Rwanda is a microcosm of what happens in the world in terms of society, as Greg uh, calls it, in terms of community development, conservation, and tourism. And it's a tiny part of the world, but it is one of the single most important parts of the world for tourism, for conservation, and communities. So the less inside the national park and around are valid for the world. And that is what is so exciting and interesting about it. Um, first of all, of course, it came out of conflict and that was an issue, but the gorillas were safe, the park functioned. The government of Rwanda from the beginning has had a very strong vision and a mission to look after its to, uh, conservation assets and its wildlife and to make sure that it goes somewhere. And they have really changed the face of conservation and tourism in the 15 or so years that um, Greg and uh, Chris and I know each other, and certainly in the 20 years that we have been in Rwanda. I myself actually are connected to the Virungas for even longer. Uh, I first went walking in the Virungas when I was 12 with my father in the 1960s, which tells you a bit too much about my age. But the, the link is particularly strong, both in terms of timing and what it taught me, because that's exactly the year that Diane Fossey was beginning to work in the region. And a whole love and work with the gorillas, as you know, has become a seminal work in the world on how to look after a very threatened species and how to protect it going forward. So these long connections have made me realize a number of things which I'd like to talk about. So in 1997, when Volcano Safaris was set up, I first set it up in Uganda and then moved across to Rwanda. And this was because of these early memories that I had in childhood of this very dramatic and special area. And as I said, uh, at the beginning, it was very challenging because things were inevitably not working. We were still in a conflict period and things were really rather challenging, especially for the local people, many of whom had been refugees who were coming back home from the Congo back to Rwanda or back to Uganda. And it was quite a, a challenging moment and philosophical moment to ask oneself the question, should one be thinking of setting up tourism when you saw vast amounts of humanity trying just to survive and trying to have enough to eat. Um, and at the time it was very complex to think about this. And in the end I thought, well, no, we should start uh, tourism because one day it will help uh, the redevelopment of this area and connect it to the world once the conflict was over. And I'm happy to say that over the last 20 years that we've been there, that in effect, we've been on the journey with the country of Rwanda, with its people, in this whole opening up, in this whole settling down. And it's been a very, very dramatic improvement from the times when both Greg and I, I think it's fair to say, when we went into the forest where the gorillas were, we'd often have to run away because there were so many militias and so many odd people hanging around, to today where Rwanda is one of the safest countries in the world, where the northern zone, northern area of Rwanda as I said before, is so, so important and so seminal for the development of tourism and how it links to society. Um, and the whole evolution of the conservation of the national park, of the development of high quality tourism, of the money it brings into the area. Um, having first started, as I said, in 2000, in 2004, I became the first person in effect in the world to build a lodge in Rwanda after the war, Virunga Lodge near uh, Parc National de Volcan. And somehow I just did it. I didn't kind of think through all the consequences, um, but it started where he and clients started coming as the country stabilized. Um, and in this 15 years, the work of conservation organization to help stabilize uh, the conservation aspects and develop them has been very strong. Government policy has been very impressive. The private sector, whether just a, a person in Musanze town trying to borrow as many dollars he or she could to develop a small tourism facility, to now international companies that have come in to build very high class tourism um, <clears throat> establishments has been really impressive. 
And if you'd asked me if this was going to happen 20 years ago, I would have thought it was impossible and unthinkable. So the journey has been really great. And from those early years that when people like Greg and I had to, in effect, set up everything, you know, build up teams of people, find staff to train, because obviously many of the skilled staff had died or were no longer in the country, try and attract clients, try and put in an international supply chain, build a reputation, and somehow start an enterprise has been challenging. And we've all faced many journeys. But from the time in 2000, when basically there was one uh, functioning hotel in the town of Musanze, the Mahabura Hotel, to today a town that has maybe 50 enterprises of tourism and conservation and community uh, tourism around, I think is a very impressive journey. And I think each of us has also tried to do different things along that journey. At Virunga, for example, we have our own community projects, different to the ones Greg has done, but also remembering all the time that the people around us are not rich. They are not interested in gorillas for the sake of it. They are not tourists. They are doing their best to survive in a very difficult environment with $2 a day income in some cases. So our projects have in some ways looked at things that they need, like sharing electricity with our neighbors, uh, helping safeguard a water source, rebuilding a local school. Um, our clients give sheep and water tanks to villagers. Again, sheep to help with manure for agriculture and water tanks obviously to make sure that they have enough water during the dry season. We have a loan scheme for women um, and have set up a clothing and a handy fracks, handy, handicrafts program. Um, and also solar power. And all these things at different levels are basically reminding ourselves of two or three different things. One is that tourism and conservation and the communities are part of the same, if you like, ecosystem, the same connection. And they must all um, work really well together for this model to work. Because in my, in my view, gorillas would not have survived without tourism. It's only by monetizing them that that has really helped uh, safeguard their future, safeguard their habitat and connect them to the world. At the same time, if you have too much tourism, that can also have a very negative impact on the gorillas. It can of course cause disease, which is especially important in today's world of COVID. It can overstress them. Um, <clears throat> But if you don't have this tourism link, why would local people want to preserve gorillas? Um, they have too many other things to do, like survive. Um, they're not going to the forest to pay $1,500 to see a gorilla. These communities need land, they need crops, they need money. Um, so we need to make sure that the money that's coming from tourism, from conservation, is going in a big part to those communities. Uh, and that the Rwandese government, of course, has uh, uh, different measures in place to make sure that there's a revenue sharing scheme of 10% from gorilla permits. There are other projects being put in place. And then it's up to all of us, whether conservation organizations or tourism organizations, to do our part. And then I think the model begins to work well. And then there's a lot to share, just like Greg is showing from his um, Red Rocks place today that there's a whole spirit of hospitality and history and cultural values embedded in the Great Lakes, embedded in Rwanda. And this is something to, we share to, with the world and be proud of it. And that's something that I think guests also appreciate and learn a lot from. Um, just to wrap up some of the things that I was saying then to bring them together, there are three points that I think are important from my journey for the last 20 years. Having kind of started being the pioneers of ecotourism for gorillas and chimps, uh, this is what I've learned. One is that um, the link between conservation and communities and tourism is critical, and making sure that that's optimized for the benefit of all three partners. Conservation has to be part of the economic mainstream. It has, in my opinion, to be, it has to pay. This might be controversial, but that's what I believe. Um, and that the reason for that is that so that wilderness produces a return for the economy, for society, especially the poor people who live around the protected area of Parc National uh, des Volcans around northern Rwanda. This may be controversial, but I think it's essential. 
that we look at this in an economic way. And in this, the, the private sector has an essential part to play in the connection between conservation and the economy. The second is that sensitive and controlled tourism is critical for great apes to survive. If you don't have tourism, I don't think they'll survive. If you have too much, they will also not survive. And that's especially true in the age of COVID where the government of Rwanda and other regional governments have introduced specific protocols. So I would urge everybody who's considering going tracking, local people in the area, all of us as stakeholders, to make sure that we follow the protocols if we go anywhere near the Gorilla Park. We sanitize, we keep our distance, we don't go into the park if we are ill. And as stakeholders in this area, we must make sure that our guests follow this. The third is that the focus of conservation and tourism has to be the communities, exactly in the sort of way that Greg's project has been doing for, year, for, for years, and we in parallel and other companies do. And that is, I think, critical, because ultimately it's, it's, the, it's, it's what will keep all three things in balance. And really, as part of this story, we must make sure that people are treated with respect so that they become the guardians of the ecosystem and the wildernesses of the world. And rather than marginalizing them or ignoring them, they must become the front line for this. This is especially true in the 21st century. Africa is the fastest urbanizing continent, as we know. Um, and Rwanda particularly is a representation of that post the civil war, where the number of people, the population is, incre is increasing dramatically where their consumption patterns are increasing as well. And they are part of this huge wave sweeping Africa where more and more cities are being created. And in the next 20 years, we'll have 20 new cities of 20 million people each. But it's not only about cities, it's people living in rural areas who are also living in an urban way with urban demands of urban patterns of con consumption. So specifically for Northern Rwanda, I would say this, that. As we've heard from Greg right at the beginning, it's central to Rwandese tourism. And as I tried to say, it's central as a model area for the whole world. Um, the Rwandese Gorilla Park and the Ugandan and Congolese uh, Gorilla Parks together with Windy are 700 square kilometers. It's a tiny part um, of the world. If you put that in context, Serengeti in Tanzania is 30,000 square kilometers. And Yellowstone in America is 70,000 square kilometers. So the pressure inside the park with the gorillas who, that live there, a thousand gorillas in all the, in the four parks that exist in this tiny habitat are already big. So protocols are very important, as I said, to make sure the gorillas survive. But equally outside the park, in the Musanze Valley, in and around Musanze, in northern Rwanda, we need to make sure that the population around is separated from the gorillas, from the habitat, that there is a buffer zone, which exists, of course, but that is protected. I know the government of Rwanda is looking at potentially increasing that buffer zone and potentially increasing the size of the park so that there is a greater habitat for the gorillas. And at the same time, we need to control the amount of tourists that visit the park as is done today. It's about 120 people that can go in we need to limit the amount of tourism development around the national park and also human development and also make sure the sanitation, the hygiene and contact of people with gorillas is limited. So I think I'd sum up and say that I hope this has um, been helpful to look at the wider context and the history of what's happened in this area. And I hope with the great vision of the government and all of our stakeholders working together the benefits of this area and its future will be even better rather than become more threatened. Thank you very much. Praveen, thank you for that super articulate overview. Um, and, and just a thanks just from a human perspective to the work that you and Greg have been doing uh, on behalf of Rwanda, but it's more than that. It's, it's like a project for humanity that you know, that's why we're focusing the lens here now on it. And the, the fortunate part of this discussion, which is going to begin here, Daniel will lead us through that, um, is, is you're sharing the real-time, real-world challenges 
from a single uh, pinpoint, if you will, on the planet. And now you've got here on this call, some outsiders, if you will, who are gonna be able to reflect uh, on some of what we've just heard. Uh, we're, we're in London, we're in Bulgaria, we're in Denmark, we're in Sweden, et cetera, all over in South Africa, all over the world, tens of thousands of miles away. And now we've just gotten a window into your realities in Rwanda. And like I said earlier, it's a gift. So Daniel, for the dialogue portion of this, how about you describe what it is we're doing, how we're going to do it and yeah. Hey, everyone again. I mean, this, uh, this uh, experience with uh, Igit Rama is so fantastic. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone to this broadcast. Uh, again, my name is Daniel Bistrom. And uh, I want each of you that is on the panel here now also to be presenting yourself. And I will give each and every one just 30 seconds. Um, yeah, will you start? Sure. Uh, Chris Doyle. Uh, I'm up here in Sweden with Daniel right now. And uh, in my background and history in tourism and everything I've done, I've often been referred to as the dreamer because I just don't really ever see limits on the potential of humans. So I focus on the stuff that yeah. people say can't be done, but I always think it can be done. That's me. And now in, in this uh, broadcast, we have different titles and he's the dreamer of the team here. Um, I would go further and, and since board uh, that was supposed to be with us here today, he cannot be the grandfather, but uh, luckily enough, we have another grandfather in the show that you have heard already. Praveen, can you just tell a little bit about yourself? I haven't quite made it to being a grandfather, but I've made it to being a very old man. So maybe <laughs> one day a, a grandfather as well. Um, well, I think you, I hope people have heard me speak. My name is Praveen Moman. I'm founder of Volcano Safaris. We've been working in the region of the gorillas and the chimps since 1997 and in Rwanda since 2000. And I suppose I'm a bit like Chris. I'm also a dreamer, um, but I also try and temper that with trying to make things happen in a real and a practical and a sustainable way. Mm, thanks. Excellent. Down over to, to Paka. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paka Mile Shazo. I go by Paka and I'm the founder of Zulu Nomad. I'm based in South Africa. Zulu Nomad, our core purpose is to be an enabler of tourism capacity and enterprise development at scale on the African continent. My role within the team is that of change architect. And I think, you know, there's so much really great work that has been done um, in Rwanda, as we can see today, but on the African continent in general, as far as tourism over the years. Um, but again, there's just so much potential to do so much more. Um, and so mine is to, to challenge where we are and to really see what can be done to take us to the next level. Excellent. Thanks. Then over to, to, to the other side of the bridge here, uh, where we meet Signa, the, the, the nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Signe Jongesel. I'm based here in Copenhagen. I'm the co-founder of Group Now, an innovation and strategic um, strategy agency coming out of, of Denmark, but working pretty much uh, all over um, with a tourism and destinations at its core. And uh, I am the destination nerd. And, and in many ways, it's a comment to the fact that I think we should be talking less about destinations and more about communities. I have a background as well in uh, wonderful Copenhagen. So the DMO, the Destination Management Marketing Organization of uh, Copenhagen. So I do have a passion for destinations, um, but the real passion is how do we make tourism a positive resource to local communities and um, bigger uh bigger and more uh agendas or you, yeah sorry <laughs> thank sorry. you good stuff and um who's next uh melena should we start with melena yes absolutely uh hi everybody my name is melena uh on this team i wear the shoes of the creative driver 
uh, and my passion is um, in imagining unconventional and smart solutions that are based on what we know about human behavior and human psychology. Uh, and of course, I'm interested in solutions that not only help make tourism better for the people, businesses and places, uh, but also make it a force for the betterment of our society and humanities at large. Thank you. Excellent. And also, Christine, the nature lover and the technical genius. <laughs> now, probably, and I hope that you will just, you know, get rid of me from the technical part. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We, so, so you cannot get away so easy. No. No, uh, yeah, uh, my, my role in this is to, to get focus on the local nature part of uh, what we are doing and, and maybe thinking about the balance between uh, the local sustainability and, and uh, so on. Uh, I work with Iceland tourism, but Iceland tourism is no different from other tourism uh, in, in the world. We are, we are focusing on getting people to enjoy and, and be travelers uh, and you know connect to the local communities and the culture of the of the country so i think that we can learn a lot uh, from other parts in the world and and hopefully we can also share some good practices excellent and that reminds me just quickly of what greg was talking about because in the backdrop we have been talking about exchange programs where we can do more of this. So it's pretty exciting that that continues to pop up as a thing. Yeah. Uh, yes, briefly, since you talked about Greg, I think it would be nice if you, Greg, again, just, uh, just tell everyone again who you are, but only like 30 seconds. How would you pitch yourself in 30 seconds? Who are you? Uh, thanks very much. And uh, thanks, Pravin. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I really liked you, first of all, uh, I'm the dream as well, because I went into this tourism back in 2000 as Praveen was coming in. And I started with the co-founder of Amahol Tours, and I started coming up with really lots of initiatives and ideas. When I was on my way going on, I started coming up with all these ideas. And I was looking up to see where can I find the box where I can be putting all these ideas. So that's when I ended up coming up with Red Rocks initiative as a non-profit organization. So where I'm just throwing all my ideas and see who is going to pick A and B so that we can just work it out and see how it works. Mm -hmm. And I have also to make a quick comment on uh, Praveen. We jumped in Congo as, uh, Congo as dreamers. So we were all starting business there. And then things started really turning up to be not that good. So one day, I met Praveen, and Praveen said, hey, Greg, how are things up there? I said, man, things are up and down. I said, it's Congo. He was like, how are business there? I said, no. Then one day, he told me, hey, Greg, I'm putting up a red line, so I'm not going to go to Congo anymore. Then I said, you know what, Praveen? I'm not leaving Congo anymore. I'm going to stay there forever. So we have been really going through this together. Thanks, Praveen. Thanks, Greg, for this. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Oh, I love this. And um, yeah, finally, if I just say who I am in, in that term, in this, in this gang, I am referred to as the fearless. And uh, I don't know what to say about that. The fearless in, in a good way, I would say that I, I am a designer. I like to experiment. I like to try new things. I think that is really important that no one actually know the best. Find out a good answer. We just need to be prototyping. We need to try new methods. We need to say yes to new adventures, as I say, buying Paca. Yeah, cool. And um, I think that is also one of the reasons why we have started this Our Future uh, talks as well. We cannot be afraid of, of getting together and, and meet as people united all, all over the world and, and get together and, and build a, a big community together, learn from each other. So, in that terms, fearless in, in that terms. So yeah, I, from that, I would like to just start kind of a, a dialogue in between the people here. And uh, I mean, you, Chris, maybe would want to start in uh, what kind of challenges and dilemmas would you think about first to, to group to talk about here? Sure. Well, I'm going to spin this around just a little bit and say the things I, I think about are the things that Greg and Praveen think about. Uh, and they shared with us quite a few, uh, you know, the, the coexistence between humans and the communities 
with wildlife and nature being one enormous challenge, one enormous dilemma. And in particular, uh, Praveen and I were speaking about um, the human density of Rwanda, the highest in all of Africa, and, um, and, and how do you deal with a finite geographic area and try to make it work, what's that balance? So that's, that's kind of the second one. Um, and then one of the things that we've talked about all over the world for geographic regions um, is looking at extraordinary destinations, but without borders, without thinking politically, thinking about a destination bigger than ourselves, but then how do we collaborate across the borders? Then the fourth thing, which is more about, you know, <laughs> the video is just incredible that we're looking at right now. Uh, the, the, the fourth key thing that we've been thinking about um, is really what Greg has manifested with Red Rocks Initiative, which is resilience by design, making a resilient community. So these are four kind of areas that we've been thinking about in context to this talk. Uh, maybe uh, Greg Praveen, if there's one in particular, you would suggest we begin with, we'll defer to you and then we'll have the, the uh, other panelists start to comment on some of these things or some of the, the dilemmas you, you pose. So Greg or Praveen, is there anyone that particularly strikes your fancy to kick off the dialogue? Uh, Prafin, are you going to go with this, or I can just come up with something? Why don't you come we... up with something, Greg? What 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 bothers you most? What did you what oh. do you feel would be one of our biggest challenges? Uh, I think uh, our biggest challenge now is we are all coming up with uh, all these ideas and uh, visions. So what I'm really looking up is how can we collaborate with us? How can we build? this collaboration between uh, people who are more interested in this. And uh, from the point you also mentioned, how can we encourage uh, our clients, like the way how they come in, they build the schools, they give out like books and everything. How can we carry, how can we build this kind of uh, collaboration between uh, our clients and us to have like regular workshops so that we can address the, the conservation, the tourism, and the community development to the guests that are visiting us? That's a great question. Yeah. I mean, I, who would like to start? I don't want to be the one that is uh, talking all the time. I think uh, it would be nice to hear it. Maybe, Melena, I would like you to start. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Why me? <laughs> Because you are so uh, you are so into it, that's why. <laughs> and behavior, <laughs> yeah, behavior exactly. Uh, you know, um, okay, so I'll take a, a, a behavioral uh, spin, uh, and I'll start with with the framing that I find myself frequently using when we discuss um, how can we make radical transitions to new ways of doing tourism, which is now frequently uh, uh, placed on the table as an issue, but we, we wonder how to do that. And, and one of the, the, maybe the benefits of the situation that we are in of this crisis um, is that while of course it has brought a lot of suffering and, and a lot of difficulties for all of us on very human, on business and societal level, it has changed our minds and have prepared, has prepared our minds for radical change of models. So some of the things that we have talked about in sustainable tourism, um, about the, when it comes to the interaction between a traveler and a local community, the interaction between conservation and business, which Pradeep mentioned earlier, uh, we have been dancing around these issues, but we knew that the system was working as it was, and it was very, very difficult to make radical changes, which we all knew were needed. Now, because of this disruption, there seems to be a readiness to accept the fact that there's space for great innovation and for radical shifts. So I think that some of these com complex issues, which we knew were difficult to change just a year ago, 
I think now we have an opportunity to lit literally sit at the uh, at the white piece of paper, design them, shape them into what we really think they should be, and try to proactively push them now in this space where things are not brought back together. So to me, that's the big, uh, a long way of saying that um, the really great uh, behavioral uh, benefit of what we're seeing now is that actually there is an opportunity to do some of these things which we haven't been able to in the last um, years. So, so a quick question on that. So the, Greg had said, maybe we can do workshops or something. So then the communities where the impact, where, where we're looking to, to seek the impact, become the innovators then and start suggesting Absolutely. new ways of doing it, but on their terms. Absolutely. That's one of the things. I mean, first that uh, there is a lot of imagination and knowledge in the communities themselves. Frequently, that knowledge and imagination needs to be mixed a little bit with outsider's point of view, because one of the one of the barriers that exists in such situations is that um, local people, because that's part of their um, everyday living, do not see the beauty of some of these basic uh, charms that all of us now are experiencing through the camera, uh, through the camera there. And all of us are fascinated, but these are the things that shape everyday realities for them. So very often they might not be able to spot these small things which are common for them, but actually are the, the carriage of, of, of beauty and spirit that fascinates us. So that's, that's why maybe that mix between the local creativity and the local passion with an outsider's point of view is probably the right way to create these maybe mini labs and mini um, creativity um, um, workshops or um, yeah, labs really uh, that allow us to really recreate some of, um, some of the models that we have been using in the past. Yeah. I've actually got a very practical example of, you know, um, what Milena is describing, just in terms of um, when we're looking at some of the initiatives that you guys are working on, Greg, one of the initiatives that completely stood out for me is the banana leaves. It's the, the bags that are made out of the banana leaves, the compost bags. I think that is such a fantastic innovation. And I mean, I don't know how those are, those are currently being sold at the moment. But it would be really, really great for the community to be able to put those those products on Etsy, for example. Um, as someone who's a gardener, I know that you know those types of products would absolutely sell um, with gardeners all over the world. You know, um, and so it's 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 connecting the community with the Etsy platform. Um, they've already got the bags. Etsy already exists. It's really not a difficult thing to do, right? Daniel, why don't you just briefly mention uh, the original intent of our future and how we were going to apply it in person? Because Milena's ideas and, and what Paka just built on, it will eventually manifest itself once restrictions lift. So maybe you can share. Can you not uh, elaborate a little bit on that? <laughs> I mean, uh, what I, I have other things in my mind. Uh, <laughs> So, but I, I, I can say what I thought about, yeah. like, because in, in all of this, we are talking about another point that we talked about, like resilience by design. As I am a designer, I think it is very important, as I said before, like new ways of thinking around the new ways of, of doing things. And that is, that is a must everywhere. We cannot see tourism as one phenomena that is the same everywhere. We just need to adapt to the local contexts everywhere. And uh, it is nothing that we should take for granted. That why why is the why why should we sometimes allow tourism and and is that actually something that we have as a right uh, as people? I think it is something that we are in in. A, if we talk about sustainable, you talk about sustain, sustainable tourism. Uh, if we talk about sustainable development and the situation we are all in and uh, Agenda 2030 and everything. 
we need to, to not only talk about sustainable development, it's fine enough, of course, but it's kind of a promise to talk about sustainable development, that we are doing something, we're doing the right thing, but we never know exactly what is the right thing to do. We need to be transforming things for real. We need to try things that we have not really imagined yet so far. Um, and that is, the, that is the situation we are in. If we talk about the Paris uh, Agreement, for example, we need to, we need to actually lower the, the climate impact 10 to 15% every year from now. That is quite you know, mind provoking if we just, but here we are in a society where you, when I see this society, it's like everything about the localness and the local culture. And that is what, what it always should be about. When I go to places, I would like to get into the, I, I want to be a temporary local as we refer to sometimes. And the, I never been so, when I see these pictures from there, I, I'm not really a smoker, but when I saw the guy smoking before, I was like, hey, I want to do that. <laughs> so we need to get the storytelling out there. We need to tell the stories, the real stories. And this is one part of that, just making this kind of like diving into to, to places like this. Now you can elaborate on what you want. I was just going to say, Greg, your, your idea to have workshops, as you know, one of the key things is that doing this in person on the ground with the community and co-creating and co divine uh, you know, uh, to, to Milena's point, you know, co-creating and defining visions, that's how it's going to ultimately happen. This is our interim solution. It's to get the dialogue started and to show and to, uh, to show the rest that we're ready to share the spirit of generosity. And I loved your comment, Milena, about the carriage of beauty and spirit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow that with your permission, I hope. So I've actually got a Absolutely. question for, for Asta, right? So you mentioned, obviously, you're in Iceland, you're working with the Iceland Tourism Board. Um, you know, one of the gaps currently, one of the very big gaps as far as African tourism currently is concerned, is our lack of focus on domestic tourism and regional tourism over the years. So Rwanda is a small country, Iceland is a small country. How would you advise the guys to piggyback off of domestic and regional travelers? Um, and in line, obviously, with the point that you've just raised, raised as well, Daniel, around you know, the, the, the climate impact. It's obviously better for the climate if people are tra more people are traveling domestically it's better for the gorillas because then we're diversifying our product. I'm very curious to hear what Asta has to say in terms of, you know, how you guys would approach something like this in Iceland. Mm -hmm. Really good question. And, and actually just this morning, we had this really big workshop with over 100 companies uh, and 200 participants in, in the whole. Uh, where we were discussing exactly this, because uh, domestic tourism in Iceland has never been something that anyone relies on. I mean, it's just good to have them, but mm, we are not, you know, focusing on that and we are not in our product development thinking about uh, the Icelandic tourists or travelers. Uh, last summer, we, we were forced to do it because we had no other choices. Uh, and I have been telling, like, for the last four or five years, you should always focus on your local market to, to get them to understand you. I mean, we are not many. We are really few. Uh, in Iceland, we, have, we are 350,000 inhabitants. And, and when tourism and traveling was allowed, we had about 2 million guests per year. So the guests were, were so many, many more than, than the inhabitants were. Uh, but now we have to rethink things and we, we need really much to focus on how to bring value from fewer tourists, of course, uh, but, but with greater impact on, on the you know, society that we are building up and, and so on. And this morning, actually, we were focusing a, a lot uh, on uh, different scenarios. Uh, because there is no way of doing plans like we like we do in, in an Excel sheet when we are planning for something that we don't know what is going to happen next. So what we were looking into were, were more like of a future scenarios. If, if, if we try to work on this scenario, then, then th this will happen. And if, if not, then, then this scenario will uh, come to life and so on and so on. And, and then we were discussing uh, what, the, what it was that we really wanted, what, the, what our strength was, 
uh, and not to to because we are always so keen on uh, focusing on our weaknesses and and what we are trying to to do better but but we forget about uh, you know to to keep keep our strengths uh, and mm -hmm. our competitiveness uh, higher so i think there is a lot of projects and a lot of thinking we need to do our homework now and focus on the domestic and local tourism because because that can uh, uh, yeah, that, that can help us in, in all the development uh, and, and choosing in, in what we really want when everything starts to get going again. I think this is also like when you talk about the future scenarios on actually dare to, to make the future scenarios, like look into the, the worst case scenario and the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially now, we are also looking into, like, of course, uh, resilience of tourism uh, during a nature disaster and, and things like that. That I, I read this uh, fantastic report from the World Bank. Uh, and I think it is something that if you, if you in different, like, uh, as a hotel, you always have a safety plan and you know all the staff know how to act if, if, it, tur if it turns, uh, start to, starts a fire. But what happens? How will you act in uh, different scenarios? And then, be kind of prepared for different scenarios. You can never be completely prepared, but that is actually bringing people together and, and start to talk about how to act, not only one, but all of us together. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the interesting things when we talk about this is also how, because you were saying resilience by design. So I think one of the big questions that we have now is how do we in the longer term plan and organize tourism for long-term resilience, not just for tourism, but tourism as a resource to also do it for local communities. And I was quite fascinated or yeah, and inspired by reading about how the revenue from the protected areas in Rwanda, 5% of that is then reinvested in a community fund and dispersed to different local projects, including educational activities, which I think this is really an example that we need to take to heart in a lot of different places. Like how do we actually um, create tourism that quite explicitly and quite directly actually give back to local communities in that sense. And we can use that also in how we build up long-term resilience for funds that you know are in place for natural disasters, as you say, or pandemic disasters is the one that we're in the middle of right now. Um, that goes with tourism taxes, but I think just thinking in terms of access to national parks and how we can create just a percentage of that revenue, we can use that to um, preserve nature or cultural heritage or invest in, you know, the education of our local uh, population. Mm. I would like to have uh, hear again from maybe Praveen or uh, Greg and uh, your thoughts. Uh, Praveen, maybe you could say something. Um, thank you, Daniel. Certainly one of the things that is interesting about guerrilla tourism, which is important to share, about, uh, share with other people, is that it is a very successful model and so far has been a sustainable model, model because of the controls. Uh, as we said, there's about a thousand guerrillas that remain, a thousand and sixty between these guerrilla parks and about half the gorillas are habituated and half them are wild. So for the habituated uh, gorilla groups uh, in Rwanda, it's about um, <clears throat> uh, 11 or 12 groups at the moment, you have to pay a very high value, especially for an international tourist and a low value if you're a resident of Rwanda and a nominal value if you're a Rwandese. Um, and each gorilla, each gorilla family sees eight humans a day for one hour under controlled conditions. So that already is a way of trying to make sure that the gorillas survive, they're not stressed, they don't get disease and they're there alive for the next day. And secondly, as we discussed, the revenue sharing is an important part of it. And these sort of models, again, some of you have picked up, I think are important to look elsewhere in the world um, because you can have, as you know, one day very low tourism that doesn't have an, too much negative impact and the next day you can get situations like Barcelona or Venice, which completely get out of control. Uh, and I think it's very important for us in different parts of the world to already plan for that so that you at some point have to start controlling numbers, their impact, what is the, what is the impact of the footprint? Um, how do you make sure that they give enough back to the communities, to the region they're going to uh, provide the support to take measures against the negative stuff they might create. Because that, of course, is another sad truth that as human beings travel, they do bring negative impact with them. 
and controlling that, reducing that is important, whether it's in their social behavior and interaction, whether it's in the environmental aspect. So the gorilla, is a, the gorilla tourism model has been seen to be one of the most successful models. Um, whereas, for example, tiger tourism and tiger conservation is less successful because it's remained low value, which is good in some ways. Uh, the cost of seeing a tiger is much lower than seeing a gorilla. But the amount of money brought in from tiger tourism and the amount of reinvestment of that back into the national parks and, and people around is limited. So that's certainly, I think, an important takeaway from northern Rwanda. It's this tiny micro area which has uh, produced something worthwhile in, in common with the other gorilla parks. I wonder, following up on that, if um, if coming out of COVID-19 has somehow at least made us as sort of the general traveler population more keenly aware that the fact that you can travel somewhere for a holiday to experience the world, and that it's a privilege and, and mm -hmm. that you have to both appreciate that privilege, privilege, but that it also entails certain responsibilities. Um, to travel to different places and to give back to those. It's a question for all of us. I, I don't know. What do you think? Does, is COVID going to, uh, to increase that mindset with travelers? I hope so. I think more sharing with people, more sharing with people you visit and countries you visit, rather than just dumping on them or expecting them to provide what you want or expecting them to be like you are. And more humility mm -hmm. and more understanding of the negative consequences that you can create. I hope COVID will help people think about this. You know, it's interesting. Um, if you look at the airlines, they're changing the rules right now in the midst of this behavioral changes. Mm. And uh, Signet, you and I have talked about this a bit. And uh, the, the notion of privilege versus right, you know, it's not a right to be able to travel and visit a destination. It's a privilege. With privilege comes responsibility. Destinations now, should they choose to do this, are now in the driver's seat <clears throat> to shift the paradigm of who defines the rules. If you're coming into my house, I'm going to kindly, diplomatically suggest that you take your shoes off at the door. This is a behavioral thing, right? I had to learn it when I came to Sweden. In America, I never did that. I just walked into the house with my shoes on. I learned it because I was a guest here in Sweden. Destinations can now do the same. They can now change the rules. They have permission because of a global pandemic, a crisis. So if you had the chance, Rwanda, to change the rules, what rules might be changed? Could we change the thinking into more of a regenerative future? If you visit Rwanda, there's going to be some specific contributions you as a guest need to make when you come here. Just an idea. I, uh, while you were talking, uh, I was actually uh, following the, the Facebook uh, live broadcast and I said to our audience, if they have any questions, so we have two questions here. Uh, one of them is, I, I like this kind of question, it's like, do you believe virtual reality tourism and online tourism will be growing? I mean, this is a way kind of a online tourism that we are doing right now. We are kind of in Rwanda. Of course, we want to to taste and experience and uh, feel with all, all, all senses. Um, I'm not sure how to, to answer that. Maybe, who, maybe Signe, you, you used to have uh, clearer thoughts on this. I, I think, well, I mean, there's no doubt that technology and the use of technology in travel plans is, is, will be growing because we've become just accustomed to having access to actually seeing virtually or digitally wherever we're going. I'm, I don't think it will replace, which is the question that I get quite often also, will it replace actual you know, travel? I don't think so, but I think we'll be using it actively in our, um, in our probing, in our planning, you know, as a a female traveler, you'll be you'll be seeing what you whatever you can see online in terms of a place that you'll live on Airbnb. You will, you'll expect to be able to go through a virtual tour somehow just to feel safer about it. Just like we did in the old days, we went to Google Maps, but now we can maybe get a live virtual tour instead. So I think it will become sort of more an integrated part of our travel planning and also our travel inspiration. But I don't think it will replace the actual traveling. I don't know if you have any other plans. Maybe. I, I think I think it actually also come to another. There's another question here as well: How coronavirus affected 
future plans for tourism. I think that is maybe a little bit going hand in hand here because as I say, uh, I think we are so much more connected today and you expect more to, to plan more. Uh, you expect to, to see more. Sometimes you could even go into a 3D model of the hotel room when where you will stay. And that is something, maybe not the standard today, but maybe that would become a standard. I know how we can actually prepare uh, people to act in a responsible way. Um, things like that, that we actually can use it in a good way as well. Uh, I was showing you before today another project that I, we are working with uh, augmented reality to get people into uh, be, be joining um, urban planning processes, for example, how you could get people uh, to, to come up with their own ideas on this is how we would like to develop our streets, our cities and such. I mean, there are a lot of promises in there, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think as far as, as African tourism, African communities, African people are concerned, like VR, as a technology is is very advanced. Um, yeah. There's there's so many um, other avenues. There's different platforms. There's different tools um, that are readily available now. That are relatively inaccessible. That are relatively inexpensive. Um, that we need to start fusing into our tourism products and offerings and our community products and offerings. Um, the crafts that you guys have there, Greg, are really, really beautiful. They need to be online. You guys need to be um, shipping those um, all over the continent, all over the world. Um, the gentleman who was smoking just now, I think he would do so great with a YouTube channel where he just, you know, teaches us what um, what goes into his pipe, um, teaches us what is in that little thing that he was drinking just now. I'm very curious to know what that was. Um, <laughs> but, but really, I think the question around VR is a great one, um, but in the African context, I think a lot of the time African people feel that, that we're out of touch a little bit with technology. You have to have all these skills, you have to have all this money. But I, I want to encourage community members, I want to encourage tour up operators on the continent, I want to encourage the tourism industry on the continent to look at the, the low lying fruit as far as technology and digital innovations are concerned because there really, really is a lot now that we can leverage off of um, to grow our communities, to earn income, to augment our tourism income. Right now, obviously, we're not, we don't have international travelers. Um, so there really is great opportunity there. Yeah, I mean, um, I got another, just before I would let uh, Greg in here again. Um, I think it is like, it's interesting. I got one one uh, from, from David here. I think the other key impact of COVID is that it has caused DMOs to reassess their role and function and their accountability to their local citizens. And this is a good thing. And I couldn't agree more. And that is something that we will see here uh, again. I mean, we are talking about what is the drivers for tourism. And we want the tourism to be, be a tool for the benefiting the local life. And we also want uh, local pre preservation of local traditions and, uh, and the culture and the nature. And to celebrate that, I would like to, to get Greg in here again and, and actually experience the amazing cultural assets you have in, in, in Rwanda. It is just mind blowing. And by saying that also, Alsta, can you put that on, on, on big screen so we will see more from that? Mm -hmm. Of course. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks very much, everybody that is listening to us uh, as we lap up right now. Uh, even before we do the closing up, uh, we would like to have like a very quick traditional dance. And I have like, you know, what Nomad Lire. Thanks for encouraging us and thanks for getting really interested in what we are doing. This is an interesting Gitalamo event that has really been going on and we have been waiting for this for a long time. So we can't wait to see this happening again in any country around the world. So we are just looking forward and we are getting on on the we are getting on on uh, on the floor to get our dance going on as we wrap up and we will finally have like the, near, the last five minutes to have like a closing word from uh, chris greg and daniel as we wrap up so let's have the dance going on okay. 
Uh, thanks very much for everybody, and uh, thanks for really uh, being uh, into our evening jitaram that we have been hosting this evening. Uh, I would like to really uh, wrap up with our dancing before I hand over the microphone to uh, Chris and Daniel, who are going to say the last word about this. Uh, I would like to call upon or uh, all the which I says we in our organization we have uh, a slogan which says great visions needs great partners. So we would really like to call upon anyone who would like really to partner with us, link up with us, and see how we can get uh, our vision really growing up, even up to South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and uh, other countries. Thanks, Chris. And uh, I hand over the mic on to Chris and uh, Daniel uh, to close up the event. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And, and on behalf of all of us, uh, I hope that you'll extend our thanks to all of the community members there who went out of the way to give us a little love and light in the middle of this dark period the globe's in right now. It was just incredible. Got goosebumps. I wanted to be there dancing. It was just super. So, you know, clearly, you know, 90 minutes is insufficient to do a deep dive into the real dialogue and, you know, questions about the dilemmas and such. So we want to make sure that uh, in this process, which we view as kind of the beginning, that we try to collect from the community, uh, from Praveen, from you, and all of the community members with whom you work. We want to hear the questions, the ideas, the challenges, ideas for partnering and collaborating. And if you can help help us collect those and share those with this team, we'll come back and just continue to offer thoughts and reflections based on what we're hearing and seeing. So 
Yeah, that. I mean, uh, for me, this has been, uh, we are approaching exactly what we want to do with our future. This, uh, and you have helped us doing that. Thank you for that, Greg. This has been so amazing and I cannot wait doing it there again together with you on the ground, dancing and, and learning everything about your culture and the instruments and, and all of that. We will, uh, as I said before, we will post all of this material. I, I think it is, uh, this has been just setting a, a great standard that we can continue with. And just to, to say in the next phase, uh, we, I think we will might uh, land in, in Greece next time. We're going to Greece next. Greece. So we'll, uh, we'll be able to soon share the specific destination. But yeah, the, the idea is just to continue to pop in like Google Earth, hear from the community, learn, share, reciprocate in terms of ideas. And like you just said, Greg, and it was a great summary, you know, how, how do we do partnerships and stuff? Great work, tech team. Yeah. Woo -hoo -hoo. Great stuff. But but extending partnerships, you know, if, if we're offering that up back and forth, then we're going to grow and we can move to that regenerative future we all seek. Um, any final thoughts from our from Praveen, from from Greg and our panelists? No, just to say thank you. I think it's a great initiative, and I think it's very important we do share new ideas, as a number of the panelists have said in this post-COVID age, to try and rebalance the world and do our bit in doing that, not just wait for other people to do that. How can each of us, as private sector people, as nonprofit people like Greg, as uh, thought leaders as clients how do we how do we make sure that we are more humble in our approach in the world and and more sensitive about all that we do Absolutely. yeah couldn't agree more i would also like uh to to reach out to, to everyone that are watching here live and also everyone that will watch this later on that this our future concept you're welcome to to contact us and if you would like to do the the similar thing and join this great community because that is actually what we are doing we are creating a community uh it is kind of we are creating a co community between communities like we started in iceland now we are adding uh rwanda to it we are adding greece we are adding you know together we are united uh, globally. And I think it is so important to have this kind of open source uh, kind of like learning platforms because we are never, never fully learned. I heard uh, this quote that, that there are no omniscient experts, but uh, what we need is um, curious specialists. I think that is, that is something we need to, and, and we need to be more um, involving in, in the processes and work as a collective uh, with efforts. Exactly what you are doing there, Greg. So I, I really admire what you're doing there. It is fantastic to see. And maybe Pak, uh, Asta, and, and you say something. <laughs> yeah, I, I will just agree with what you're saying. This has been really, you know, a learning curve to, to participate and learn what the issues are over there. Although we are really, you know, not alike, we are alike. So, so that is a really good takeaway from this. Our issues are uh, in a similar way. So thanks. I also want, sorry, I also want to say that it's extremely inspiring uh, to, to learn and, and to hear what has been happening um, in this community and I think that the power of what we're doing now actually lies in connecting with each other to inspire each other to think bold because we have a window of opportunity to do that and physically we are isolated in different parts of the world but on a human level we are connected and through our joint creativity with our joint inspiration that we share I think we can inspire each other to really take um, that proactive and bold stance and at setting new norms of behavior um, where destinations and local businesses are bolder in setting the rules, as Chris pointed out, and travelers are humble and more respectful when they visit um, these places. So I hope that uh, this is the inspiration that uh, is one of the outputs of what we're doing here.
No, an absolutely an inspirational um, session and, and really view into communities on the ground in Rwanda. It, it really is truly special, especially in this climate that we're in. And, you know, when I posted the, this event on Facebook, the first question that came up was, you know, how can young South Africans get to Rwanda? What do we do when we're in Rwanda? So, so I, I really am glad that we've had this, this session as it opens up really, really important and fruitful discussion within the continent ourselves amongst young people um, who've never had an opportunity to travel our own continent before. Um, and so it, it is a very, very dynamic and very interesting time and thank you so much, Greg, and the community members um, for hosting us today. We've learned so much. Love the instruments, love the drums. It was really, really great. I really wish we could have done this in person. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Great stuff. Signe, any, any last thoughts? Uh, it's difficult to add something clever after so many clever people. Uh, <laughs> So, no, but thank you so much for inviting us into your work, Greg. And I, I think it's uh, it's very inspiring. And uh, and I also think that it's important to have these discussions, both in terms of the, um, as you're saying, Paga, the the the, Paga, the awareness of travelers in terms of our roles and responsibilities when we travel, but also the new roles of destinations and how we plan and structure uh, tourism. Um, to better contribute really to local communities. So important discussions to be had. Excellent. Well, with that, uh, Greg and Praveen first and, and the communities that you serve, thank you for being a part of this and helping to make it happen. To our, our other thinkers who contributed to this, thank you for investing the time to study up on Rwanda and just be a part of the dialogue. And then to everyone listening through the Facebook streaming, thanks for being present. And to the degree that you feel comfortable doing so, we highly encourage you to share, share the program, talk about it, continue to provide feedback, send us questions, uh, and we'll just continue down this path. So Please. with that. Yeah, with that, I think we will Thanks, start Daniel. up. Our, yeah, we will continue the uh, the Igitarama here from Malmo, yeah. uh, and uh, and join you for that. And I think uh, the Igitarama will just go on all over the world for everyone that has been listening here now. Right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.